The end of Sabaody introduced an interesting concept, which is that for the first time, all of the straw hats are separated. It allows us to get a more personal view of Luffy as a character, as well as being able to get a glimpse into Luffy's mind after the absolute dunk that he experienced in Sabaody. But this isn't just Luffy's situation. Everyone's trying to get back to Sabaody. Everyone's on a different island and some of the crew members are going to struggle to get back home. Without help, I can trust Frankie to get back to Sabaody. Maybe Nami if she had a boat. Though maybe we'll just get another Gaiman situation where someone like Chopper will just be stranded on an island alone forever. The Vivery card helps you navigate home, but honestly, the harder part is just trying to survive sailing across the ocean. I'd be interested to see the list of competent pirates who are able to get stranded and then make their way back. As for Luffy, he got sent flying to Amazon Lily, an island which made me think throughout the entire arc that wow, if Sanji got stuck here, he would have just been a goner. So I think with the introduction of the Vivre cards that all lead back to Sabaody, it acts as a way to reconnect all of the Straw Hats, but it also creates an interesting mechanic, which I don't think we have or probably will see ever. But if you wanted to, you could totally use a Vivre card to reach certain locations instead of using an Eternal Pose. Vivi, for example, probably isn't going to leave Alabasta. Dr. Kuriha is probably not going to leave Drum Island, which probably makes Vivre cards really good devices for being able to travel towards these islands. And if there wasn't already some sort of eternal pose, I could totally see these things being used to identify locations. Like if the world government would uh, have a person stay full time in Ennis Lobby or Marijua so that like marines and admirals could travel there easily. Maybe even have admirals hold on to the cards of uh, uh, the celestial dragons so that the admirals know where the important people is in case they get kidnapped or something. With the Straw Hats flying from one location to the other, it got me thinking about Kuma's ability to send people flying to specific islands within three days or so. Like when the Straw Hats hit the ground, it looked like it was gonna be really bad. There was like an outline of a paw print, but then I realized that like the Straw Hats hardly looked hurt. I wanna say that somehow the paw print is able to create some sort of cushioning around the person being launched uh, in order to keep them safe. And I mentioned that because because depending on how fast it is, since it can practically take you anywhere within uh, almost three days, assuming that you're going to be all right when you get there, you could probably use this to launch somebody extremely far away to get somewhere extremely quick. It's maybe faster than a ship. I don't think you would actually do that, but if you wanted to get halfway across the world, Kuma might be able to send you there within three days, where it might otherwise take you way longer to reach there. All right, Amazon Lily. I think this is the only island so far that we're aware of that is actually an island in the Calm Belt, which is cool because we haven't seen a lot of the islands in a Calm Belt. How does anyone do anything? I think that for Amazon Lily specifically, besides Boa and the strongest people there, no one can leave Amazon Lily because of the immense amount of Sea Kings. A lot of the Navy people have ways of passing through the Calm Belt, but it's interesting to see how people of Amazon Lily uh, get through the Calm Belt, whether it's through the poisonous snake creatures or with the raw strength to take down a Sea King. We've seen other characters do it. So do the people of Amazon Lily. The Navy officers, uh, while waiting for the Calm Belt, seem to have other officers there who can take down Sea Kings too, because it's terrible. It just seems terrible. Like, maybe it's safer for Amazon Lily. It has this sort of uh, natural protection there. And I can't imagine so many people are wandering through the Calm Belt for fun. Amazon Lily has just interesting world building, like the mushrooms that Luffy eats, which are also kind of uh, thematically relevant in the sense that Luffy is trying to cope with the fact that he just lost his entire crew. And so he's trying to make himself laugh by eating these mushrooms, which uh, <laughs> when you say it like that, sounds extremely depressing. 
Throughout this entire section, he mentions his time with Garp, which seems similar to this. So besides what I assume was some sort of like physical training when he was younger, practicing, uh, fighting and such, I thought that Luffy might have learned some sort of botany. And uh, he would know what kind of mushrooms are safe to eat from the ones that he found. And I thought, oh, cool. He's actually smart about what kind of mushrooms are safe to eat. That makes sense. He's a character that likes eating stuff. And then, no, he, he didn't. Luffy had no idea what he was doing. That's like the number one rule of foraging. It's like, don't eat anything that you don't know. And probably don't eat anything that you do know because you might misidentify it. And uh, nature will kill you very quickly. Which is exactly what happens to Luffy. Luffy eats deadly mushrooms and then he dies. <laughs> okay, he doesn't die. But if there was ever a place for Luffy to die, this would be like the lamest way to go out. The, <laughs> the most anticlimactic way to die. Luckily, he gets saved by the women of Amazon Lily, which are all sort of uh, these strong women uh, warriors, which is kind of a staple of fantasy media. Like Wonder Woman is probably a good example of this. So this is kind of similar to that, except there are some new unique twists to this formula. I like how a lot of women here are like different sizes, not necessarily the scale of a giant per se, but just like the scale of Whitebeard, for example. A lot of uh, Akuja are big bigger than Luffy himself. From the auction house, we're aware that there's at least a couple of different varieties or, or species of human. I don't really know what the right word for that is, but maybe somebody who is big, but not as big as a giant is uh, maybe like a long leg here, or maybe just humans can get naturally that tall in the world of One Piece. One Piece just likes to play with scale a lot. Another interesting trait is how almost every woman of Amazon Lily doesn't give birth to men, only to more women, which then return to Amazon Lily. I don't know, it's just very interesting conceptual world building. It also kind of reminds me of uh, Gerudo from The Legend of Zelda, which also has an area of only women who then uh, go out, have a spouse, have kids, and then those kids then come back to Gerudo Town. Amazon Lily just gives off beautiful snake vibes. Like there's the entire mountain structure of Amazon Lily being just a bunch of snakes, as well as a bunch of residents having pet snakes, which everyone uh, seemingly must have had before the event of the Boa Sisters. So I wonder if uh, when the world nobles enslaved the Boa Sisters and gave them devil fruits, if the world nobles intentionally gave them snake fruits because the Boa Sisters were from Amazon Lily as like a cruel joke. And then afterwards, when the three sisters uh, escape the world nobles, the three of them managed to create this narrative around their abilities using the Medusa story, which I totally would have believed, by the way. Like Medusa's abilities are split into the three sisters. Yeah. I believe it. So the three sisters would have totally been able to use this Medusa story, which explains the weird snake abilities, but also grants them higher status. And sure, there's always been kind of like an empress in Amazon Lily, including the old grandmother character. But I wonder if it wasn't until Boa's story and the fruit abilities that occurred, uh, which the grandmother doesn't have, that would have given these Boa sisters like that extra level of respect and authority. Because to everyone in Amazon Lily, this is just magic. Boa never explains devil fruits to the people of Amazon Lily. She's like, yeah, we got just cool powers now. And that's all the info you get. The introduction of Amazon Lily allows for such an isolated headspace. Like, sure, we have a lot of new characters, but for a lot of the story, Luffy is either alone or an antagonist to these characters. So we get to see how Luffy would act after the events of Sabaody. His main priority is to get back to his crew. He is both optimistic about the situation and in a hurry to get back to his crew desperately so. Which isn't helped by everyone in Amazon Lily being in opposition to Luffy. And I think a lot of that charm of Amazon Lily is being able to see the transition from a place of opposition to a place of acceptance. Everyone out there saves Luffy thinking that he's a woman that just went out there and just died. 
Luffy gets the mushrooms off of it. He gets cleaned. A certain mushroom tries to get removed, which, boys, I know y'all cringed because uh, that would have hurt if you weren't made out of rubber. But now... <laughs> But, but I guess now we know that Luffy can stretch everything. And from there, it just never gets better for Luffy. It's like, oh, you're actually a guy? Boom, prison. It's like now Luffy's kind of screwed because he just kind of ruined the entire point of Amazon Lily, even if he wasn't intending to do so. And so he's kind of like a monkey in a cage where uh, anything he does is being analyzed, which is great. It allows for uh, so much character for the women to have no idea what uh, men are and to be so curious because Luffy is such a odd, odd boy. Nobody on this island knows what devil fruits are. So when Luffy stretches out his limbs or inflates himself, everyone's just like, oh yeah, but that's a thing men can do, I guess. Everyone's just writing down theories of whatever men are. It's like, oh, men stretch out their limbs and they're extremely aggressive and they store jewelry in their body, which come on, man, I thought that was supposed to be a secret. But for the story, it just works. It allows for a little bit of breathing room before uh, we enter these two bigger arcs on either end while also reminding us that Luffy being an Amazon Lily doesn't mean he's got free. And you know, I get why everyone's trying to hide Luffy from Boa. Boa is the type of person who actually kicks animals for fun. We don't really know how strong Boa is, but I kind of like this different approach where we didn't directly confront her because I think it introduces a new opportunity to showcase Luffy beating a warlord without directly fighting that warlord. Though what I found so interesting about Boa is the complexity of her character and the more we understand about her. For example, a very typical evil character thing of her that we're shown is her kicking animals. And we're like, okay, yeah, ha ha ha, she's evil. But did she start doing that because she was a warlord with a lot of warlords like uh, Mihawk having this disconnect between other people and themselves? Or did Boa do this because people see her as attractive and so everyone lets it slide? When she does anything bad in her own island, do people let her get away with it because she's just the empress and or because she's attractive and powerful? Which is exactly what's valued in Amazon Lily. And is Boa using that to further do whatever she wants to do, kind of like a spoiled kid who people let off the hook? And so now, what I want to know is that later on, when Boa becomes attracted to Luffy, is it partially because Luffy is indifferent to Boa? Like, Boa is overly aggressive and tries to dominate the conversation, which usually works because everyone in turn uh, <laughs> is a simp, pretty much. So does Luffy in this case stand out because he doesn't conform to what Boa is used to and rejects her? Kind of like someone telling a spoiled kid that they're not special? I might be diving too far into this. All right, let's talk about the snake battle. The Boa sisters just completely wrecked Luffy for a lot of this fight. And I think it totally could have been another Kuma situation here. A little bit weaker, but Luffy is not winning these fights anymore. Because even though Luffy did, yes, win this fight, I think that currently, Luffy just lacks the strength and knowledge to continue into the new world with newer enemies using hockey that Luffy can barely control. The fight itself was great. We got a lot more info on hockey, which I'll get into in a second. And I think we're just able to provide a lot of contrast here between Luffy and any of the Boa sisters, especially in regards to his actions. Like whether it was removing people who are turned to stone from a fight or separating public fights from personal matters. Like we got to see way more character from Luffy. Like when he chooses not to strike one of the snakes while she's down and instead helps her. I could uh, totally see another character being like, ha ha ha, I got you, sucks to be you. And then somehow trying to use that as leverage to escape Amazon Lily without understanding the further context, but not Luffy. As a side note, we now know about Conqueror's Hockey, which is what we've been seeing a lot, but we're also now getting newer versions of Hockey, like what we're seeing the other sisters do, either to damage Luffy despite his rubber fruit ability, or to move out of the way and just predict his movement. 
I think Conker's hockey is a subset of hockey the same way that like zone types is a subset of devil fruits. So we know that like hockey has like an offensive and a defensive strategy and also kind of like psychological elements to it. Like at the very bare surface, we've seen Conker's hockey being used to make people uh, get knocked out. But I also wonder if it can do other things. Like can Boa use it to manipulate people's emotions uh, using hockey to make her fruit easier to use. I think this fight also just reintroduces us to the fact that Luffy is still this consistent character willing to set aside his own ambitions in order to help others, even in times where he can't afford it, which is even noted when he sets aside his own goals and bows in appreciation to Boa for not killing the statue women, even though Luffy himself has conquers hockey and presumably shouldn't be bowing down to anyone, he still does. Interestingly enough, I think it parallels well to places like Drum Island and Alabasta where we had also two strong examples of rulers doing exactly that. Amazon Lily, even though it could have totally been disconnected from the rest of the story, like we could have landed on a random island, perhaps Long Ring Long Land 2? Instead, the story manages to reconnect Amazon Lily to the events of Sabaody. Like sure, we get a little bit of info on Conqueror's Hockey, but it makes it very clear to us that Luffy specifically is not going to catch a break. Instead of calming down and taking this time to process what happened, we're instead dedicating this time to showcasing more of what the Straw Hat saw back in Sabaody. The auction house is just a tipping point. Now we have firsthand some of the events that happened in Sabaody, as well as hearing some of the events that occurred in Marijua, along with learning about the symbol on Boa's back and the story of that one person who managed to sneak in there and break out the prisoners from Marijua. So maybe that's hinting that the only other person who's also been crazy enough to do something like that, Luffy, might do the save at some point. That Luffy might go into Marijua at some point and cause damage. And, you know, at least in that aspect, I can understand why Boa likes Luffy. I realize that there's a certain irony there around a person with the love fruit loving someone and not being loved back. Like, even at her most exposed moment, there was no effect on Luffy. And while we're at it, I kind of want to discuss the concept of love in One Piece, which I found extremely interesting because at least with how it's been showcased, love is kind of a magical element in the world of One Piece. As like the previous Emperor said, love strikes like a hurricane and it's fascinating to see the like almost lethal cursed aspect to it where a person in love is persuaded to do almost anything, even if it's completely against the person's self-interest. And it got me thinking about Sanji, the simp. It explains so much. Everybody was like really confused and questioning like, why would Boa agree to help Luffy and participate in this war? But it totally makes sense if we look at how Sanji has acted throughout the story, where he quite boldly states that he can't control himself. Being a simp is too much in the world of One Piece. So maybe, yeah, Sanji can't stop being a simp because like Boa, it would kill him. <laughs> And for as much as it may feel like Boa is quickly willing to do anything for Luffy, I think that Boa's story wouldn't have worked as well if we already weren't aware of yet another simp. But because we're aware of another character already willing to do anything for a certain person, I found it way easier to accept Boa being willing to do anything for Luffy. Which transitions well to Ace. Because Amazon Lily isn't just connected well to Sabaody, it's connected well to Ace's story with Boa specifically having a direct connection to Ace and the situation that's gonna go down. It's extremely fascinating to me the way the world government is handling Ace's situation. The world government is making such a big deal out of this conflict. 
You could have just executed him before Whitebeard got here. But instead, I'm realizing that there's this buildup, letting Ace live, and then publicly announcing his execution date. Why? Why would you do that? Is it a power move? It's a pretty good power move. It could also just be a chance, because the world government is so aware of Whitebeard's actions, of him being bold enough to head over into the world government, that the world government might just have been planning to capture him and his crew, considering that most of the admirals are over there. Like, most of the admirals are over there. Most of the warlords are over there. The world government wants this conflict, and they don't just want to execute Ace. They want to go after Whitebeard and maybe Shanks, too. And I think here is where I kind of understand Luffy's perspective a bit. Because on the one hand, he shouldn't go after Ace. We saw him get obliterated. And that was just by one guy on probably the weakest time in Sabaody's history. If that happened on Sabaody's weakest time, imagine heading against the strongest. Plural. Multiple strong. Like, no, no, you're a godder there. The past empress says it very well. You're gonna be like an ant heading into a storm. Like, Luffy, you don't stand a chance up there with the big boys. So, then why would he go? I think it's the same reason that he acts in Sabaody. Simply put, if he had another option, he would take it. If he stepped back in Sabaody and maybe let people capture Kami and then trained and got stronger and then eventually came back, he could probably stop the auction house for good. But then Kami would have been gone by then. He has realized he is weak, but he doesn't have the time to get stronger. He doesn't have the time to move past the ceiling because things like Kami's capture or Ace's execution are happening right now. And those events are not going to be waiting for him to catch up. And I think that's the beauty of this saga. Like, what is he supposed to do? He can't just be like, oh, yeah, I guess I'll let my brother get executed. No, I get it. I get it. It's good. Go in there, Luffy. Fight the storm. <laughs> get, get butchered out there.